everybody. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. We are back with another episode of the Fit Down Chat, and we are all the way in Long Island for it. So let me introduce our guest today, Charlotte. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. I can't wait to chat. Yes. Um, my name is Charlotte. I'm a fitness professional based out here on Long Island and a lover of all things wellness, yoga, strength training, heart health. My fitness journey started in 20. 11 and I've been a wellness lover ever since. So the main thing that I want to chat with you about today was FH, which is something that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and I would actually love for you to explain it sure. to everybody, just what it is, because I obviously like don't even know how to talk about it. Yeah. So why don't you explain that? Sure. FH, it stands for familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a really fancy way of saying genetically high cholesterol. Great. So genetically high cholesterol is different from regular high cholesterol. We hear high cholesterol, and a lot of people think it's because of the foods you eat, because you're inactive, you don't do a lot of moving, you just don't really take care of yourself. But with somebody with a genetic version of this, um, there is a defect in one of my chromosomes where my liver just pumps out cholesterol. So my body is creating cholesterol at a rapid rate as opposed to me eating unhealthy foods that are clogging my arteries. So this disorder, it affects one in 250 people. So it's not super uncommon. Wait, that's actually quite common. Yeah. It's a lot of people have it. And the crazy thing is that 70% of those 200, one in 250 people don't know that they have it. Wow. And how, how do you find out that you have it? So it's um, a blood test mixed with your family history, mixed with potentially a genetic test. Because it's chromosomal, not... Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So the crazy thing about FH is, like we said, it's super common and 70% of the people who have it don't know that they have it because you don't feel it. And if you look at me, I don't look unhealthy. I live, I've been petite my entire life. Yeah. I've never been somebody who you looked at and been like, oh, she doesn't take care of herself. She is crazy high cholesterol because it's just going on inside. So with, with FH, you don't feel it. The only way that you would know that something is going on, really the indicators that you want to ask yourself, if you get a cholesterol test and your cholesterol is high, they say if your LDL is, I think it's over one. 50? You can edit that in, put that somewhere yeah. on the screen. Yeah, if your LDL is over a certain amount and you're somebody who takes good physical care of yourself, then that's kind of a red flag that something might be going on. So if your levels are high, specifically your LDL, then you want to look at your family history. Okay. Do you have anybody in your family who has had an early heart attack or stroke, um, who has lost their life to a heart attack or stroke? Um, and if so, how often has that happened? Like how many generations of people have been affected by heart health issues? Wow. If you have a genetic um, component, meaning like your family history shows that there is early heart attack and stroke in your family, then the last question you ask yourself is, do I take good care of myself, um, good enough care of myself that would mean that my cholesterol level should be low? Meaning if you exercise, if you eat heart healthy um, and your cholesterol is still high, then there's three triple red flags that say this might be FH. And then is there a specific genetic test mm -hmm. to take from there? Okay. Yeah. A lot of people don't even need that confirmation because the other steps indicate that FH is, is the issue. So I, did, I opted to not get the genetic test because my cardiologist and my FH specialist were like, this is what you have. Um, it runs in my family, obviously familial hypercholesterolemia. My older sister has it and she opted to get the genetic test, which confirmed it. Okay. So I'm like, there's no point in me getting the genetic test because it's so clear that that's what this is. Yeah. Sa save the time. Give us the awesome. Yeah. Sponsored by Duncan. Sponsor Justina, Dunkin Donuts. Please. I would love to hear a little bit more about like how you found out sure. about it. Sure. So when I was 17, let me preface this by saying my entire childhood, I was one of those who just like didn't really, I never really played sports. I danced a little bit, but never played sports. I was never super active. Um, and my version of eating was like melting cheese on everything. I love yeah. cheese. Cheese is the best. So I, every meal I had would be like melted cheese or like sausage or hot dogs, like all of those quintessential unhealthy foods. So that was my entire childhood. But again, I'm super petite and I've always been petite. So I never really felt like, and I never got the messaging from doctors that 
you have to be healthier. Yeah. Because I didn't look like it. I didn't look like I was unhealthy. So fast forward to age 17, unexpectedly lost my mom, which was hardest thing ever to go through when I was 17 years old, like a teenager. So she passed. And if you looked at my mom, she was like a spitting image of me just with brown hair. So, so petite. On the outside, you think this is a really healthy woman. She had minimal stress in her life. She lived in her dream home, stay-at-home mom, gardened, awesome, awesome life. And then one day, it was just one heart attack that took her life. And so a few months after that, my dad was like, we should all get our cholesterol tested just to see. Because we found out that my mom had, I think it was 100% blockage in her arteries. Wow. Yeah. So there was, from the outside, nothing wrong. From the inside, a lot wrong. So it was one heart attack that took her life. Um, So after my sisters and I got our cholesterol tested, my cholesterol numbers came back, and the doctor called me, and they were like, come in ASAP with your dad. We want to talk to you. So we go in, and they tell me you have high cholesterol. And I didn't know what that meant at all. I was just like, oh, high cholesterol. Like I was, I was 18 years old at that point. Like, what does that even mean? So they were basically just like, this is something serious. And the doctor, I might get emotional, you guys. Um, but the doctor said something that completely shattered my heart and changed my life. Um, so super insensitive, but he was just like, if you do not fix your lifestyle, you're gonna end up like your mom. For somebody who's 18 years old and just lost their mom a few months ago, the insensitivity, it stabbed me in the heart. At the same time, that comment changed my life and we'll get into that, but it was a really, really tough thing to hear. So the doctor said that. Immediately, I'm like standing with my dad. We like grabbed each other's hands. Like, you know, when you just have that um, communication with somebody like a friend or something. You're just like, what the fuck? What the heck? Sorry. <laughs> oh, you can curse, you can curse all okay. you want. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so after that, the doctor was basically like, we are putting you on medicine. We want to put you on 40 milligrams of what they call a statin. A statin is like the first line of defense for somebody with high cholesterol. Um, it's a medicine that I actually forget what the mechanism is, but it's a medicine that treats high cholesterol. Okay. So they were like, we want to put you on 40 milligrams. Again, I was 18 years old and statins have a lot of side effects. So what are some of the side effects? Do you remember? Yeah. So, um, muscle fatigue, muscle pain, memory loss. Oh, um, damn. Intense side effects. Yeah. Um, joint pain. Not just like you might get a little sleepy. No. Okay. Way more than that. So, um, when the doctor said that, I immediately went home and I was like, should I fill this prescription? This is nerve wracking. And my older sister who recently was diagnosed with high cholesterol as well. Um, she was like, Charlotte, before you fill that prescription, let's just try everything we can naturally. Because again, I, my diet was cheese melted on everything. So like, who knows how much of that was actually diet and, and actually my insides. Yeah. So before I took any medicine, I said to my doctor, listen, I'm not ready to take medicine. I want to attack this all naturally first. So that's what I did. I went completely vegan, fat-free, gluten-free, sugar-free. Oh, wow. It was so restrictive. And I started exercising hard. So my fiance, he was into fitness already, boyfriend at the time. He was into fitness already. And I knew nothing about fitness. Like the extent of me working out was putting sweatpants over my jeans in gym class and like pretending that I was changed (laughs) for gym because I didn't like to sweat. I didn't like to move. It was like, oh, so, um, I knew nothing about movement. So my boyfriend at the time made me this, um, this program. He called it Russ Sanity, like in like a play on insanity. His name is Russ. Yeah. I'm obsessed with that. Uh-huh. And it was really just like explosive movements, like burpees, squat jumps, split jumps, um, paired with like lightweight. Cause I never held a dumbbell in my life. Tricep kickbacks, like all those fun little things. So as soon as I started working out, I was like, this is amazing. The endorphin rush. It feels so good. So exercising paired with vegan, gluten-free, sugar-free, fat-free. And I'm not exaggerating when I say fat-free, like even good fats. I was scared of avocados, scared of peanut butter, scared of almond butter, like scared of nuts. It was crazy. Um, But anyway, after I got into the swing of diet and exercise, 
I noticed how good I felt and like physically and my cholesterol levels dropped a hundred points. So wow. it was a significant drop, but I will caveat that by saying, if you're somebody with high cholesterol, don't take what I'm saying as um, a permission slip to go gluten-free, fat-free, vegan, because I don't think that's healthy. Um, and we can, we'll t- probably touch more on that. Yeah. But um, me doing all of that lowered my cholesterol 100 points, but it was still high. So that told me that, okay, there's actually something wrong. So I went on um, a different type of medicine, not a statin, a drug called Wellcall, which is designed to take the cholesterol out of the food you eat which was kind of counterintuitive because I wasn't even eating anything with cholesterol because I was so dead set on not eating anything that would raise my cholesterol. So um, the reason I went on that medicine was because I saw a cardiologist in New York City, like a world-renowned cardiologist. And I went in there and I told him about my numbers and my family history. And he looked at me. He go again, so petite. I'm probably 19 at this point. I'm laying on this chair. He's like doing some sort of assessment on me. He grabs my stomach like this. And he says, you need to lose this. No fucking way. Yeah. And it was this much skin. I wasn't fat. I didn't even have an ounce of fat Yeah. because of my diet and my movement. So he grabs my skin and he goes, you need to lose this. So that doctor mixed with the first doctor who's like, you need to change your life or you're gonna end up like your mother. Those two professionals, and that's the only experience I had with professionals about this disorder. Those two kind of like sent me into a spiral of orthorexia. So I became obsessed with losing the skin on my belly. So even more restrictive than I was with my diet, even more movement. And it just became so unhealthy. Long story short, My hormones got messed up, didn't have a period for a very long time. I'm 30 years old and I'm still trying to regulate my period because of all of the stress and trauma that my body experienced by not getting the right amount of nutrients. And um, I thought I was doing such good for my body, but I was wrecking it. And it turned like really the thing that I've learned in this past, I don't know, 15 or so years of having this diagnosis, probably around that. um, No, a little less than that but is you can try to control everything and it might still not be enough. And there comes a point where you have to surrender and, and recognize that there are some things when it comes to wellness and health that are beyond our control. Yep. And that was such a hard lesson for me to learn, but it was so important because it got to me to where I am today. You know, the other thing is, I know you mentioned you were 19 Mm -hmm. when this doctor literally pulled on your skin. Yeah. Um, And, you know, Charlotte said she's 30. I'm 34. Like, we are, you know, millennials. Mm -hmm. And if we think back to that time, we did not have the information of what we have now in terms of understanding what diet culture is, understanding that, you know, two weeks to summer body, bikini, whatever, on, like, the cover of Women's Health magazine. Mm -hmm. Like, that was normal. Yeah. That was so normal. And slowly but surely, I feel like a lot of that is getting undone yeah. or at least brought to people's attention that like health does not look the same mm-hmm. on everybody. Mm-hmm. So I, I just, I want to make that point because this was, even though it was 10-ish years ago, completely different time. Yeah. Well, well, piggybacking off of that real quick, like two years ago, I went to pick up my prescription for the medicine that, that I was on uh, prior to the medicine I'm on now. So I go to this um, pharmacy in Astoria mm-hmm. and I go to pick up my medicine and the pharmacist is like, is this for you? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, you know, you can just eat well and exercise, right? When I tell you I wanted to punch this man in the face, I wanted to punch him straight in the face. I didn't. I was just like, just so you know, like, I think I, I forget what I said, but I said something like calm and I set my boundary and I just told him a fact. And then I walked out because it's, I'm so done with putting people in their place for having those opinions of like, you know, you can just do this yourself and shaming me. Screw that. The fact is, is no, I cannot goodbye. And it's, it's their, it's their, um, responsibility to, to learn that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 
That is the ultimate version of mansplaining. Yes. <laughs> See, now you can just die next to fuck right off. <laughs> oh, and then like also um, going back a little bit, when I was first diagnosed with high cholesterol, FH, um, I was in high school. So I remember being in my senior year of high school in my health class. And we got to the lesson on um, like blood pressure and cholesterol. And my health teacher goes, um, yeah, and then there's, there's something called cholesterol. You guys don't have to worry about that. And that was like a month after I got diagnosed. I remember going home and being like, what the heck? Because like, it's so common that yeah. people have this. And to be in a health class and just be told, like, you don't have to worry about this. You don't get your cholesterol tested until you're at least like 25. It's so harmful. Yeah. The earlier you catch FH, the more likely that you are to live a long, healthy life. So I'm just really hopeful that this is becoming more mainstream and FH is becoming more um, popular to talk about and to learn about because it affects so many people. I actually did have high cholesterol when I was a kid. Did you? Yeah, but it was because I ate like too many tasty cakes. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I was also, I was really thin. Yeah. And I actually, I don't know why my cholesterol was tested, um, but just one year at the doctor's, it was like a little elevated. Mm -hmm. And my mom was like, yeah, maybe like you don't need to have like five sweets when you get home <laughs> from school. I'm like, you're probably right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I was fine once yeah. I stopped. That's good. I'm glad. I'm yeah. glad you don't have to worry about that. But you know, it is, it's, it's uh, what would have happened if I didn't take that test? What would have happened if I didn't understand that like that wasn't a healthy habit, right? So I, I think that in general, the education of how to feed yourself mm -hmm. and how to take care of yourself mm -hmm. for long-term health, mm -hmm. not just these short two-week, one-month, two-month challenges or goals that people put on themselves that don't build any long-term habits and really don't help you in the long run, yeah. I think is missing in our industry. I agree. I agree I'm completely. sure we'll talk more about later. Let's do it. <laughs> so we learned about what FH is. We learned about how you discovered you have it. How about now? Yeah. So at age 30, I've tried a bunch of different medicines. Um, the one I've settled on right now is an injection. So I take a biweekly injection right in my belly. The belly that that doctor squeezed and said I had to lose is now home for my injection, which is the best thing ever. Full um, circle. Yeah, full circle. <laughs> so um, I take an injection every two weeks in my belly. It's called Repatha. And it basically, the mechanism of this drug, if I'm remembering correctly, since I've been on so many, um, <laughs> this one stops the amount of cholesterol your body creates and increases the amount of receptors, like LDL receptors, they call them, that bring the LDL out of your body. I think it does both of those. I could be wrong. Um, eh, it doesn't matter. But it does something really good. <laughs> and it works really well. <laughs> I take that injection and then I eat 80% heart healthy and then 20% I say for my soul, soul health. Yes. Because with FH, with orthorexia, with all of the years that I have been so hard on myself and restrictive in, in the food that I eat, I really make it a point to feed my soul, I like to say. The medicine that I'm on allows me to do that. Mm -hmm. And that is such an awesome thing because somebody with genetically high cholesterol, like you worry. You worry that your arteries have clogged. You worry that you'll you'll die early. Like those are actual legit uh, legitimate fears. Um, and at the same time, treating this this disorder um, appropriately and being on the medicine that allows your body to be a normal person is a really important thing to do. Like. I cannot even tell you the freedom that I have now being on a medicine that works and caring for my body in the, in the food that I eat and also like allowing myself to be a normal person because I don't skip dessert. I love dessert. There were years when people would be like, you're not going to eat a brownie. And I would like in my head be like, I really want a brownie. And then they would be like, why don't you just eat a brownie? And then I would have to go into this whole thing because I have genetically high cholesterol. It was a nightmare. So at this point, biweekly injection, 80% heart healthy, 20% soul healthy, and then exercise and movement. So I love yoga. I'm a yoga teacher. Um, and strength training is one of my favorite things ever. Newfound love. Ooh, we'll yeah. have to touch more on that. Yeah. And 
I think you just make such a great point. I love your language around this too, like 80% heart healthy, 20% for your soul. I always kind of abide by a similar, I was about to use like a workout term, a similar split, <laughs> a nutrition split. <laughs> but, you know, I say like my fun foods. Yeah. Um, but I feel like that is such an important thing for everybody yeah. because we really disregard how much something like stress impacts our health in so many different ways. 100%. And the stress of obsession of eating clean, perfect, healthy, like whatever whatever your version is mm -hmm. of that really takes a toll. Mm -hmm. I had very similar experiences in like my early 20s in terms of like, I mean, orthorexia type behaviors, which we didn't actually explain, but that's essentially just um, obsession with perfection around your food and your exercise. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it, it affects a lot of people, whether you get a formal diagnosis or not, or, you know, but some type of disordered tendencies around being perfect mm -hmm. with your choices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you, I always try to remind myself and the people I work with, when you are 80 years old, like you're not going to think about that time that you shouldn't have had the brownie. Like you're going to think about all the things you said no to mm -hmm. when you could have said yes in a healthy moderation. Yes. A hundred percent. I remember when I was like, can I say balls deep? Yeah. I remember when I was balls deep <laughs> in like eating really well. And, um, you know, those like pill or vitamin things that are like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I had one of those and I would put one chocolate covered almond per day. And that was the treat that I allowed myself to have. Don't do that. One chocolate covered almond. It was like my vitamin. Like the thing about that too, and like it's, and it's the, the always thinking about when can I have the, the fun food or the treat or the cheat thing next. Yep. And so you're setting yourself up with that every day. It's like, I have it. And now I'm looking and I'm like, okay, I can't, I cannot wait until tomorrow when I've earned this next chocolate cover. Like the, the amount of thinking of like when I can have the cheat thing next or the sweet thing or the fun thing is I, who wants to live that way? It's, it's debilitating. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yes. And I used to work at a, a deli with my sisters and my friends, a local deli. And we, I would literally take a bite of like crumb cake, chew it and spit it out. Take a bite of a bagel, chew it and spit it out. Cause I wanted that taste so bad. Horrible. Yep. Horrible. So it was like, those were the really hard days yeah. where like in it, you think you're, I remember thinking I was elite. Like thinking, I know so much better than these people. I'm eating healthy. I'm just going to chew this and spit it out. So disordered. Oh, yeah. I feel like this is a good way to kind of um, transition into the fun questions. Cool. We've gotten all the emotional stuff out. Yep. We've, re we've relived our past trauma. <laughs> um, this is one that I've been asking everybody. What is your pet peeve when it comes to fitness marketing? You can, you can give me one example, two, whatever, whatever your heart yes. desires. There are a lot that come to mind. Mm -hmm. I think, and like, I feel like a lot of them are like fitness professionals like us probably share the same ones, like summer body and like all of that shit. Hate that. Mm -hmm. But I think one of my biggest pet peeves is, um, is more in the way that influencers market, um, wellness and fitness. And it's, it's kind of this one size fits all approach where if you don't do it this way, it's not going to work. Ooh. So give, like, give me an example. Yeah. Yeah. So like, Let's just talk about like morning routines, for example. You scroll on TikTok, what do you see? Morning routines, the 12 steps to the morning routine. You wake up, you meditate, you journal. If you look at your phone the second you wake up, you're a piece of shit. Like, <laughs> it's, you are, we are just like fed the correct way to start your day. And assuming you all have an extra hour in your day, assuming that you all have access to all these types of things, and it, it drives me insane mm -hmm. because we know that we don't all have the same 24 hours in the day. We know that some people are morning people. Some people are night people. Um, some, for some people, meditation is torture. For some people, journaling is all hell breaking loose. Like it, there's not one way to do something correctly. And um, I feel like it's just all over social media. And I'll admit, like when I was a few years ago, when I first started the fitness, um, like micro influencing on Instagram, I felt the same way. 
And it comes from a good place because it comes from a place of this works for me and it works really well and I want to share it with the world. Yep. So I can look at that stuff and feel so, it's such a pet peeve and also have compassion for the person being like, you just don't know. So that's my long answer. I love that. That's such a unique one too. We haven't had that one on here. Mm. Why don't you tell me, I've been asking this question to everybody, but you come from a yoga background. So I've actually done a whole video on yoga too. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why that's relevant here. Okay. So <laughs> we're getting loopy. Um, why don't you tell me your favorite pose or position or even like flow that you love to perfect with clients across the board mm -hmm. in your yoga classes? So there's not one single pose. And the reason I say that is because every body is different. Mm -hmm. When I teach yoga, you can just see it. Um, everybody has different anatomy. Everybody has different ability. And so my favorite uh, technique to teach in yoga and to perfect is breath work. So important. Yeah. I would argue breath work is, is even more important, different, but even more important than the physical yoga practice, what we call asana. So yoga, I don't know how much you know about yoga philosophy, but there's a little bit. So in yoga, there's something called the eight limbs of yoga. This is by a guy named Patanjali. And these are basically like eight steps to reach the ultimate goal of yoga, which is called samadhi, which is like enlightenment. It's like ultimate connection and union with the divine, whatever that means for you. It's this ultimate state of bliss. And one of those eight limbs is the physical practice of yoga. So as we can imagine, there's so much more that goes into yoga than just being able to do warrior two and peaceful warrior. Mm -hmm. And another limb is called pranayama. So that is the breath control, the breath work. Yes. Um, I've heard that term. Yeah. I didn't know what it meant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So pranayama, it, bre it breaks down prana is life force energy, also known as the breath. Okay. And then yama, um, it translates to restraint. So it's kind of like breath restraint, breath control. Um, so it's just all different types of breath work that can connect us to both our sympathetic and our parasympathetic states, which are equally as important to have. Um, but one of my favorite things, getting back to your question, to perfect with students and the community is breathing in a way that we're utilizing our full capacity. So before I started yoga, I think about breath and it was just super shallow in my chest. Mm -hmm. And I know you do a lot of breath work too with, with your prenatal and your postnatal, like, and how important that is to, to yeah. breathe deeply. When I first started yoga, it was just really shallow chest breathing. And one of the first classes we were like laying down on our back and the teacher was explaining how to breathe. And, and she started in the belly and I was like, how do I breathe into my belly? It was like a foreign concept. And fast forward to now, I'm so many years into my yoga teaching career. I've got advanced certifications. Like breath work is a no brainer for me. I don't even think about it, but for somebody who's brand new to yoga. And if, if you're watching this too, and you have never heard of pranayama or breath work or belly breathing, this could be, you know, your, uh, your gateway, your gateway breath to, yeah. to breathing fully. Um, so in, in yoga, the, the breath type is called Durga breath. Durga pranayama. And Durga really is three parts. So it's belly, ribs, and chest. So when we inhale, we take the breath in through the nose, and then we send the breath all the way down our lungs so that our belly can fill up, then the ribs, then the chest, and then exhale fully. I love that. And learning that, like, even just with one breath, we're turning on our parasympathetic state. We're, we're toning the vagus nerve. We're increasing this feeling of safety and security and calm and relaxation in the body. And um, it's such a powerful tool. It's so simple, but it's so powerful. The simplest things I find across the board with insert anything yeah. are the hardest. Yes, because it's the foundation. Yep. I would actually argue that the more that I continue to educate myself and learn too, I would say breath work is probably the most important thing when you're strength training Agreed. as well. Mm -hmm. Because when we think about, you know, when I think about breath work in terms of strength training, well, I'm thinking about our TVA, which is basically like the deepest muscle of your core and it's going to help protect your spine. Very important. Mm -hmm. We're thinking about our pelvic floor, which, oh my God, the more I learn, I'm like, it, it should be everybody training their pelvic floor, not just pregnant women. Um, and then our diaphragm. Yeah. 
So if we think about this whole core canister, if we don't have proper breathing mechanics, well, we're not going to be able to create intra-abdominal support. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be able to lift as heavy. Mm -hmm. We might have some pelvic floor disorders mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to get older and be able to jump around and not like pee yourself yeah. a little bit, yeah. it's really important to learn how to breathe. I have so many clients who breathe like that, like inverse breathing, where when they inhale, they actually shrink up. And when they exhale, they think of pushing their belly out when it really needs to be the opposite. And I think so much of this is related to stress as well. Stressful breathing is typically up here. Um, but honestly, I think the other part of it is that we have all been trained to suck our bellies in yes. and look skinnier. Yes. And I had a client one time where she was like, oh, I guess I've just been sucking in my stomach my whole life. <laughs> Literally, and you don't even think about it. I still do it to this day. Oh, I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to relax. Yep. Because when you're tense like that all the time, that is a trickle-down effect with your entire everything. Yeah. So I am obsessed with that answer. Yay. So since we're kind of like tying in breath work, oh my God, wait, this was not even scripted this way. This worked out so well. Breath work, yoga, strength training. Talk about the space we're in, right? A breathe strength, baby. That was perfect. <laughs> yes. And we have one, two spaces. Mm -hmm. Talk about it. Yes. So let me back up a little bit. My fiance, who I mentioned before, Russ, he and I started dating when I was, um, actually, he met my mom the day before she unexpectedly passed, which is crazy. Oh my God. Um, so I know we have her blessing to get married. We get married in September. Um, and I could talk about that for 25 more hours, but I'm not going to. Um, but him and I started dating in high school. And once he, he was always into like lifting and he has Crohn's disease. You hear him? Woo! Crohn's disease, baby! <laughs> he has Crohn's. Um, and one of the, the best ways for him to help with that diagnosis and management um, and self-confidence as, as a younger guy with Crohn's was strength training and building up his body and building up his confidence. So he was a fitness enthusiast way before I was. Um, he introduced me to, to strength training and fitness. And um, him and I both got certified in, I started as a group fitness instructor. He started as a personal trainer and we worked together as personal trainers at a local gym in like, I don't even know what year it was, 20. 13 or so. I don't even know, but we started a while ago. Yeah. Um, and for the longest time, we always said one day we're going to open something together one day, one day, one day. And, um, we, our, our relationship continued to blossom and, and bloom. And we got more into the fitness and the wellness world. He became a strength training coach, powerlifting coach. I got my yoga certifications and we kind of, um, where we started both as personal trainer trainers, like similar modalities, we kind of split to the point where he's more strength and I'm more calm yoga. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was always our goal, like open something together one day. It'll be really great. And then we broke up for a little bit. And in that point of our breakup, it was a two year span. He went and he opened up his own gym, mm -hmm. his own personal training studio, which is his original location is actually like one minute down the road here on Long Island. So he opened this personal training studio and he killed it. He, I was so proud of him. We were broken up, but I showed up to that grand opening and I was like, you go Russ. Like it was so <laughs> cool to see his, his dream come true. So he focused on his own space. I moved into the corporate world. I focused on my career for a little bit. And then after two years in corporate, I was like, I hate this. Mm -hmm. Literally don't want to do this anymore. So Russ and I, um, we ended up going on vacation together to California. And on our last day, we were just friends, just friends. We fell back in love on that trip. But um, on our last day, we were leaving. And I was just like, I really do not want to go back to my corporate job. Like, I'm going to get back from vacation and what, have to go sit in an office in like tight skirts, like, oh. Yeah. And he was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, open a yoga studio. And as I'm saying this, I'm like picturing myself being like 40 years old. Maybe I'm already a mother. Like that's down the line. And he just goes, okay, so do it. And I was like, me right now? He's like, yeah. I was like, okay. So it was just that one little like handout of permission that like I could do this mm -hmm. that really made it real. So I went back, um, back to work, put in my two weeks after I had found a space to, to renovate and everything and opened up my first yoga studio in Astoria, your hometown. Um, 
and it was awesome. We opened in, in 2019. It was called Breathe Strength out, out on 36th Avenue, right by the subway. Um, and I was open for five months before COVID hit. Womp womp. Lost everything. This, the yoga studio that I opened was funded by the inheritance that my mom left me. So my entire wellness journey is kind of centered around the fact that like my mom is no longer here. She's, but she's my guardian angel. And she's like, she like laid the foundation for me. Right. So like she passed, I like to say that her passing saved my life. Had she not passed, I would never get my diagnosis. Well, I probably would way later. Yep. So she passed. I got diagnosed with FH pretty early so I could get started on treatment. Um, her inheritance allowed me to open up this beautiful space, which funny enough, I signed the lease on her birthday, which was May 1st. So it's this idea that like my mom was born on May 1st and so was my yoga studio, which was like a gift from my mom. And then COVID hit. My mom passed in 2010 on March 15th, March 15th, 2020, 10 years later, my yoga studio passed. My yoga wow. studio, that was the last day my yoga studio was open. So my studio has the same birthday as my mom, the same death day as my mom. And it was funded by my mom. It was just crazy. Yeah. So it's, it's as heartbreaking as it was to lose it. That, um, that connection makes me really, it makes me feel close to her. You know, Absolutely. it gives me purpose. So going back to your original question, lost that studio after COVID, it was like a shit show. I taught online virtually. I taught at the local park, Rainy Park in Astoria. Ended up moving back to Long Island, which is my hometown. Um, and then Russ's lease on his first gym was up in like a few months. And he was like, I really want to expand. He goes, I would love to have like a little yoga studio in the, in the next place that I open. He's like, would you want to join forces? And I was like, at first I was like, no, I don't want to. Because I was so traumatized from losing the space that I like poured my soul into that I just did not want to take the risk again. But, um, but we took the risk and I'm so glad we did because we've got breathe strength studio, which we're in right now. Next door, we have pulse barbell club, which is the strength training portion. Um, and crazy part ready going back to that timing. So if you remember, I said, Russ met my mom the day before she died. Yeah. So Russ met my mom, March 14th. We opened this space. March 14th. No freaking way. And it wasn't supposed to be March 14th. It was supposed to be a week earlier, but it got pushed back because our inspector said, you need to add a mop sink, which we've never heard of in entire life. It wasn't on the original plan, but we just so happened to add this mop sink. And then the grand opening was March 14th. And so that is wild. So a little bit more wild, craziest part is so it's just wild. So Russ meets my mom March, March 14th. She dies March 15th. My studio, my first studio opens on my mom's birthday, closes on her death day. Two year break in between my studio closing to the new one opening. It, it was kind of like, so March 15th was the first day that we had classes here. So it was just like a two year break. Um, just like Russ and I had in our relationship. We had a two year break. It's, it's crazy. It's just like the synchronicities, like one part that I just love about like spirituality is that you can choose what you believe and those beliefs can give you purpose and, um, and energy towards what you want to do. And those dates lining up like that, it just makes me realize like I'm in the right spot and everything I'm doing, even though some days it doesn't feel like it. And some days I'm just like, what the fuck is happening? Um, I go back to those dates and I'm like, no, it's laid out right here. It is fine. Everything's working out. Charlotte, why don't you tell people, aside from this studio right here, where else they can find you? So everything we teach in the studio, which is out in East Northport on Long Island, we live stream. Um, my website has all the information there. So I'm at breathestrengthwellness.com. So I have live classes that you can stream into. I have a whole on-demand library of over, I think it's like over 600 classes at this point, which is crazy. I also co-host a podcast called Stronger Together with one of my best friends and my original yoga teacher, Leslie Van Bell. So that's Stronger Together on anywhere you listen to podcasts. And I'm all over TikTok and Instagram at breathe underscore strength. Amazing. And I will link all of that down in the description box. Definitely give Charlotte a follow. And thank you so much for taking the time to do this and lending us your space. It's stunning. Here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And get your cholesterol tested, guys, because yes. you never know. And then cheers to Duncan. Aww. Cheers to Duncan, which you'll be sponsored by. Woohoo! <laughs>